was poppin'. I go by the name of Hurricane Chris. I just jumped off the porch with dirty gloves, bastard. She did. We gon' make it rain straight, honey. Talk about some money. We gon' talk about some money. So all I wanna talk about is some money. When back to back losses ahead, you was out, you shouldn't have been sending that shit in the mail. I told a plug he need a better method until he get that don't send another. All right, y'all. So we have the legendary Hurricane Chris with us off the porch today. How are you feeling? I'm good. How about yourself? What's poppin'? I am doing very well. Now, you know, I told you earlier that I am a little nervous because when you interviewing somebody that you used to watch when you were younger, it's like, damn, I cannot believe you're sitting in front of my face yeah. <laughs> right now. But yeah. I do want to take it back with you and your life in Shreveport because that's where you're from. So how would you say the streets of Shreveport were for you back then? Shreveport, the streets of Shreveport, um, it's a small town. Um, everybody know everybody. Everybody family connected in some kind of way. They know each other. Um, grew up going to church. Um, grandma made us go to church every day. Um, coming home and playing football with my friends like a regular kid. And how would you say they've changed, the streets of Shreveport have changed from back then to now? We was playing with footballs and basketballs <laughs> They playing with sticks and brooms and mops. <laughs> like it's different. Um, we was real kids. A lot of the stuff I see kids doing now, our mama would have beat our ass if we would have even thought about doing it. What? Okay. Like, and I know you got a son, so are you like super strict like how your mom was with you? Nah, I ain't super strict. Um, I think. The, the like, um, this generation, my son generation, they all going in the right path. Like, he eight years old. Um, the majority of those little kids right now, they going on their own path, like, far away from what they dad or their mama, any of them doing. Um, it's because they got more access to the internet. Um, they learning more about what's right and what's wrong before you have to teach them, so. Actually, I think it's better now. Yeah, they got more information. And back then, you weren't into the street life, and I find that really interesting. Um, how did you, how were you able to really keep yourself out of that? I've been doing music since I was like 12 years old. Just before I could even come out the house past eight o'clock. You know, so my first time staying out too late was at the studio. You know, my first time getting in trouble for uh, whooping for staying out too late, I was in the studio. It's just kind of like what I've been wanting to do my whole life, you know. While everybody else was saying, let's go in the store and steal, I'd be outside writing a rap under the car porch with a karaoke machine or something like that. You know, just all I ever wanted to do. And so when I was watching one of your interviews, I saw that you said you actually grew up with Boosie. I ain't grow up with Boosie, but I grew up around Boosie. Um, when I was probably like 12 years old, I used to come to Shreveport all the time and do music in our studio. So that's kind of how I first met him. And then when I blew up, it was kind of like a reintroduction. Like, you know, I didn't even remember who I was. It just continued, the relationship continued. And another thing that I find really interesting about you is that you dropped out of high school but your mom was pretty supportive of that because she want, she was also a, wanted to be a rapper as well. Yeah, um, I mean, it was, I can't say that's the best choice for everybody to make. You might need to go to school, but for me, it was like, it was obvious what I needed to do. I had got so big in my city, it was like I was gonna miss my opportunity if I ain't take it. Or, you know, that's how I felt anyway, so I choose to stop going to school and do music full time. And what was her exact words when it came to you making that decision? It actually came after I, um, I just started rapping so much that I wasn't going to school. The studio was right down the street from the house, so I was leaving. I go to class first period and then find a way to leave and go to the studio and record. <laughs> 
So it was like, it was just, it was just what I was gonna do. I was hell bent on it, so they just made it easy for me. It wasn't nothing they can do to stop me from rapping. I wasn't, I was focused on nothing but rapping. I told the teachers that, everybody. I got teachers that told me, you know how hard it is to sell a million albums? Is you crazy? Chris, listen to yourself, you sound stupid. I had teachers tell me that. I sold way more than a million. And you did it. <laughs> listen. Um, and getting into your career, you were introduced to us at like 15, 16 years old. So what was it like for you being that young, experiencing the industry like that? It was stressful. It was stressful. Um, like I say, I was, I was young. Like you said, I was young and everybody around me was adults. Um, so I was a kid around a bunch of adults, you know, and I was forced to make decisions amongst adults. Um, some of the decisions, they may have had more knowledge than me. So sometimes it may have panned out better for them. You understand what I'm saying? Um, I, was, I, was, I was more focused on doing the music and I depended on the people around me to make sure that the business was straight and that didn't happen. You understand what I'm saying? Like, when they came to me, they told me, we finna, we finna um, get you the best deal we could get you. And these was my homies. Um, and when I started having turmoil with the label, I called them and I told them, yo, I'm having problems with this situation. You know, you, you walk me into it, maybe you can help me mediate the situation. And he bagged up and was like, nah, I ain't got nothing to do with it. Really? So it was kind of like you put me in a situation, then turned your back on me. So I'm 16 years old trying to politic and figure out how to get out of a contract that I ain't happy I'm in because, you know what I'm saying, it was all done out of other people's motives and, and wants for what they was trying to do. I didn't want to take the deal. I, had, I was saying no, and they seen it in my eyes. That's why they got so stern on me and told me, man, just trust me and don't even think about it. Just forget everything you're thinking and trust us. That's hard to do because you don't even know them. But like when you that. seek, no, I do know them well, like not, that. I trust them. Like that, These, the uh -huh. people that's telling me this is my immediate people. Okay. So I trust them. Uh huh. And it's for a kid. When, when you 16 and people 30, 40 years old telling you, we got your best interest, just let us do this. You used to adult having your best interest. When your right. mama dropped you off with an adult, she told you, listen to what they say. You understand what I'm saying? So it was a situation like that, you know. But I guess, you know, people was more focused on what they wanted out of the situation. But at the end of the day, I focused on learning how to run my money up on my own. And it just got to the point where I was making stupid money with music or without music. So, so, so now it's something I can do, you know, comfortably and out of my own pocket and be my own boss and no middleman. You feel what I'm saying? Um, I was watching your Vlad interview and you spoke how you blew a lot of money like around that time at like 16. What was you uh, spending your money on? Everything I wanted. It wasn't nothing. I, if I wanted it, it, I bought it. I ain't think about, and I ain't want to know what it cost. I got, I had anxiety with hearing the price. If I know <laughs> I wanted it, I know I was gonna get it regardless. So don't even tell me the price. Whatever, everything. About me. Did my you mom. still keep some of your stuff that you bought, like, back then? Um, mm, uh, nah, a lot of that material stuff, I, like, it didn't mean nothing to me. So when it was time to shake back, you know, it was shake back time. I really let go of everything that I didn't need in order to be able to reinvent myself and, and, and come back even harder and stronger. It's crazy now because I play with more paper right now than my... CEO gave me for a baby really? on my own. Wow! I make more money on my own than my CEO gave me for a baby. I seen more money in three months of my own money of me learning how to do real estate businesses and just invest my money. Then I seen I seen more money in like probably three months than I ever seen from my CEO. And even when I got out of my deal, I had to go get lawyers to go get all the money that was left over there for me. You feel what I'm saying? Like, 
this, this shit was hell, bro. It ain't, they ain't tell me nothing about the money I had left on the table or nothing. Them people ain't give a fuck about Hurricane. You understand what I'm saying? This real deal spill, Jack. Yeah. And I also um, heard you say that you were very guarded back then, like really guarded. And what would you say, in what ways did you have your wall up just dealing with different people? Um, my wall was up because I was around people that was, you could feel when you're being persuaded. So if you've been persuaded to come in a room and talk to me, you may not be as open as you should be, and I may notice it. So that was the wall that people noticed. I'm in a room that I don't want to be in. I'm in a whole situation that I don't want to be in. I was finna say no to the whole deal. Like, Jay Prince called me like, whatever they gave you, give it back. I give it to you times two. So it was just, a, it was a weird situation. Wow. Now you do have your hands in a lot of different businesses, and I kind of want you to give us some game, because like real estate is one of the really big things that's going on right now. Right now I'm focused on 18 wheeler companies, um, and my next thing is, well right now I'm trying to obtain an apartment complex. Oh, that's And weird. you want to know some game? What? Like, you can, you can easily make ten, fifteen thousand dollars off of one 18 wheeler every month. So just imagine if you could get that game down packed and understand how to get somebody to dispatch loads and hire drivers and do that times 10. You feel what I'm saying? Like the sky's the limit. With real estate, it's like when you pass by these lots and you see these lots for sale, calling them and ask how much the lot is instead of calling Mercedes and asking them what your credit score got to be to get the new 550. Find out what your credit score got to be to buy some land and tell the bank to build you a house on it. Finance that and then sell it. Learn how to play with money, you know what I'm saying? Learn how to, that's the, that's the country. Everybody who doing bad ain't figured out how to deal with money. You ain't figured it out yet. Like, I ain't running in no rat race no more. If I want a Lamborghini, then we going to the Lamborghini dealership. And I don't want to know how much it costs. I know that's right. Like that. And just to uh, go back a little bit, I did not know that you used to be a battle rapper. Yeah, that's how I kind of, you know, got popular in my neighborhood, doing little battles, going on different little occasions. I ain't, I wasn't really in love with that. I wouldn't really try to jump in their lane and take none of their shine. Um, you know, that's just something I did in the hood. Now nah, I wouldn't do it. Really? Yeah, it's too disrespectful. I ain't finna stand there, bro, and just talk disrespectful to you. And right. It's crazy. I don't care how much you pay me. My grandma wouldn't. If I told my grandma, they paid me to tell him his grandma ain't shit. My grandma wouldn't give a damn how much they paid me to tell somebody <laughs> that they grandma ain't shit, you know, or something like that. Like, money, it ain't got no, ain't no price for everything. Right. You can't pay me for everything. And I always wonder how people got the, the mental strength to deal with somebody speaking about They want their money. Dead, they like, want that money. All of that. They, that, that money is, is a crazy thing. That'll make people do crazy stuff, bro. That money. Anybody that let you stand in their face and tell them about their relatives that's not here no more and how you wish even worse on them and... That ain't art to me, that's just like evil darkness. I wouldn't want to be nowhere around that. Ain't no boundaries. I like life with boundaries. I don't like life with no boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I feel like our generation is life with no boundaries. Yeah, it is. I mean, what's your generation? Um, I am a millennial. Okay. I was born in 95, so. All right, all right. Yeah, 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 retarded. <laughs> All the way retarded. <laughs> now, you know we got to talk about A Bay Bay because I was a youngin' when it came out, but I saw how much it had impacted the older ones around me and just like the club scene, the music scene. So I'm very curious to know how exactly that record unfolded for you. A Bay Bay, it was just something I did after the club. I was in a club I wasn't supposed to be in, probably like 15, 16 years old, I knew the club owner. And when I left there, I went to one of my homeboys' house who was in the club too, sloppy drunk. And he just was like, let's record. 
I just got on the mic and started saying something, bro, and it just, that's what happened. I swear to God, I ain't have no plans on it. I mean, I, it's, 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 it wasn't planned. And the saying, a hey, baby, how did that even come at the top of your head? Where did that come from? Um, they were saying it in the club that night when I was in the club. They were saying it, hey, 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 baby, hey. It, like, the club was just going crazy. I'm like, as soon as I got to the house, it was still in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I just recorded it. Um, I ain't paying no more attention after I recorded it. It just started surfacing on its own. Like people start saying, "Actually, I ain't want the record to go out." When the people who put the record out called me and told me they put it out, I was mad. Really? Yeah. Then they told me, "Well, we ain't gonna put your record on nothing else since you're mad about this. We ain't gonna mess with you no more." So I, I, I was like, "Bet I." Right. They put the record out. The record did what it did. Wow. So when you first recorded it, were you kind of just like, this is a little play song, like it's not. Yeah, I was, I rap rap. So I wasn't, I didn't really want to put it up. Wow. So you didn't know that it was going to take off like it did. I didn't have no idea it was going to take off like it did. I didn't hope for it to blow up or nothing. It was just something I did and forgot about, you know. And going back to when you said they were saying that in the club, were they saying that to women or was it like? To the DJ. To the DJ. Okay, okay, okay. I've always wondered that. It was it it's just like, turn up. Hey, 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 hey. You know, I seen them doing it and I said, let's make a song out of it. Oh, you know, it's all making sense. Cause it's like, you want to know what we say in the club and then it's, hey, babe. Ah, okay, 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 okay. It's unfolding. <laughs> Now, after the success of A Bay Bay, did you have pressure on you to continue to keep up with that momentum? Yeah, they wanted me to put out nothing but them same type records. And that's not what I do. I don't have no more of them. There was something I did drunk at 16 that I would probably never do again. Like, it's, I don't make goofy songs, bro. I rap. That's just what I like to do, you feel me? I don't knock nobody who do make goofy songs. But it ain't what I like to do. And on the remix, you had people from Boosie, E-40, and so many others. How were you able to get rappers from all different types of cities to come together for that song? The label bust the chick. I it's heard. Been chick. <laughs> it's been a real deal bag. It's like, it's a real deal bag. It's, it's a, it's a real remix. I, E-40, The Game, Baby, Boosie, uh, Jadakiss. It was crazy. Um, it was a bag they bust for that. They had to spend a lot of money to make that remix happen. And I know you mentioned um, in an interview that it was like 16000 like for features within, for the remix. Hell nah, they wanted what? <laughs> Way more than that? Yeah, yeah, they was in there. Birdman was on there. You think Birdman wanted 16000 Hell no. <laughs> Birdman wanted a bag. Yeah, it was it was it was a real deal. It's like a half a million dollar remix, easy, up close. And I do know with your album, um, it was delayed due to them pushing a Bay Bay. Yeah, they kept pushing a Bay Bay and delayed the album and delayed the album and delayed the album. I finally exploded on them, and the CEO got mad because I exploded. And he didn't like what I said in the interview, and that's when I fell out with the label, really. Really. Yeah, for good. Why? But I'm, I wonder, like, why were they delaying it just due he to... He was trying to juice the hell out the single, or maybe he wasn't ready to drop the album, but I started going to interviews, and people like Greg Street was telling me, man, your project looking crazy. Where's your album at? Like, what's going on? Like, and it was, it was, it's embarrassing, you know? I put everything in y'all hands to do what y'all supposed to do with my whole career. I don't know what they was doing with the album. I guess they were just focused on singles, trying to juice me as a single artist. I wasn't with it. And did it lessen your excitement when the album finally dropped? It lessened everybody's excitement because they waited so long and they let the anticipation die down. They only focused with singles. They got the, they got the money for the album, but they weren't focused on really, you know. The, the remix, the one remix song, Mm -hmm. Had more features than the entire album. They put more money into the remix 
Then they did the actual. Then they did the whole that album. No That's because they was trying to create new ways to keep juicing that same song. Label don't give a fuck about you. They give a fuck about the content they got that can make money. If a label can make your song go viral and bury your ass under the dirt and nobody never know what happened, it'll be a lot of buried rappers. This shit grimy, dirty. You understand what I'm saying? For real. And you said it took for you to basically explode on them for them to finally release the album. I did an interview and they was asking me the same question you asking me and I just, that was the tip of the iceberg. Like, you know what, I'm finna tell you what's going on. The label, ask the label. I don't know what's going on. They delaying everything. CEO found out about that. He called me like, yo, I'm gonna make it to where you ain't even on 106 in Park no more. And beefing with me like that. So that's where we went left. Wow, and speaking of 106 and Park, I did watch another one of your interviews and you said that uh, Terrence J said he didn't like the song. Yep, Terrence J said he didn't like the song at first. <laughs> How did you feel? Were you kind of just like, whatever, like? I wasn't tripping. I wasn't tripping. I don't know him. He don't know me. Now your album, 5150 Ratchet. Looking back, what did that album mean to you at that time? Um. 5150, the album, it meant, the album to me, bro, originally, it was supposed to mean my introduction to the world, you know, in the way that I wanted to be introduced. But from the way everything happened, I left my entire, com like, creative space. I couldn't create the way I needed to create. Mm. So I, I didn't care about none of it after it came out because it was put together so commercial and like, it just, I didn't feel real. Everything was put together by other people and I didn't have nothing to do with the track list of the album, what was on the album, songs I thought was gonna be on there was took off and they never told me about it. You know, um, we didn't sit down and discuss nothing. It was just, they were just making decisions. You understand what I'm saying? Like, so at that time, where was your headspace? Um, I need to figure out exactly how to get the same amount of money without nobody being able to stop me. I need to make sure I could be my own boss. So that's when I started buying up real estate in Shreveport, buying houses. Um, opening halfway houses, renting, selling, chicken and waffle restaurants. Just, this was me, like saying I ain't finna take a hand out from nobody or wait on a hand out from nobody. You know, I'm finna put my future in my own hands. And from then on, it's just been business plan after business plan, whether they was big or small, whether they worked or whether they didn't work. Um, that's, that's what it's been to this day and that's what it's gonna be. I know that's right. And fast forwarding to my favorite song by you, Holly Berry. That one really took over Dallas for sure. And I know you actually worked with some people from Dallas as well. So how did that track exactly come about? Brian was, Brian was through with me at that point. He didn't want to work with me no more. Um, I told him I had the song Halle Berry. They didn't even, they wasn't even excited about it. Um, me and a guy named Anthony Murray, he put me in a car drove me all around to every radio station. He had managed like BG and Juvenile and all them back in the gap. So he was like, he knew how to hit the ground and get a record moving. So he just took me around everywhere and got that record moving. And, and next thing you know, the record label started calling saying, we got a video date set up for Halle Berry. Back, <laughs> back in the mix all of a sudden, like, well, this ain't about nothing. And did you kind of get to witness how Holly Berry took over as far as like the music world? Yeah, I saw her doing the dance on Ellen, on the Ellen show. That's when I knew it was crazy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I also know that the label tried to make you change the name like so many times. They did change the name, they changed it. I ain't trying, they didn't try to make me. This is what I'm telling you. They was making all the decisions. I didn't know nothing. 
till I look on the internet and the name of the song changed to She's Fine. <laughs> it, it sure was She's Fine. Why yeah. did they do that though? They said they thought Halle Berry was gonna have something to say and then turn on the TV, Halle Berry dancing to it. It's like, it's, it just was overthinking. This was, I don't know, bro. It was, it was a lot of crazy decisions made that I didn't make. It was a lot of politicking. Over politicking. And when you dropped that, your second album, um, with the, you didn't, did you really have the label's help on this second album that you dropped? Or you kind of just took it on your own like you did with Holly Berry? He still had me in contract. And if he free up some more money for me another album, then he get his percentage off of it. So he was just trying to whip up a project real quick, chunk it out, get the money from the majors that, that funded everything, keep it moving. <laughs> He's looking at it like a bank move, you feel what I'm saying? Like, he ain't push shit into that album. Shit, nothing. Nothing. Who you had on that? Feature from Bobby Valentino or some shit like that? Bro, come on. Why you ain't go get Gucci Man and all that shit? This RCA, J Records. They, they put the money up, you heard me? They ain't give a damn. They ain't spent, you feel me? That one song they did, you know, but that, that one song probably was, by the time they spent the money on it, they probably had already made that amount of money. So looking back at, the, at that time, um, would you say that it was kind of like a, I wouldn't say a dark time, but was it somewhat close to that? Yeah, it was dark. Very dark time. I was very stressed out around that time. Yeah. And you took a four year hiatus from the music. So tell me about that. Um, like I say, that was when I really took a break. It was when I was paying attention to learning other ways of getting money so I could be able to invest into myself and nobody can't tell me what tomorrow gonna look like. So that's, that's, that's all that time was about when I took the four year break. It was just four, five years, however many it was. It was, it was just me becoming a, a, a stronger man business-wise and learning how to obtain that check. Now, back then, you guys were still in the CD era, so now we have all of these different streaming music platforms. How would you say, um, the coming from the CD era, era to now coming to the streaming platforms is a little bit easier? I didn't come from the CD era to the streaming platforms. Um, I came in the game in the beginning of the streaming era. Oh yeah, because it was MySpace. Yeah. And okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, so I'm like the birth babies of the, the streaming era. I'm like one of the first products of that ringtones and all of that digital era, period, you know, started just digitally, period. And, you know, so I know everything that's going on because I watched it happen. And you were the first artist to really test out Pandora too. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Pandora, they called me on the phone for me to set up my radio station and talk to me and ask me who else do I want to play on it. I don't, I don't know if they do it like that now, but I was actually on the phone with Pandora setting up my station. It was when they first got started. I was like, what the hell is Pandora, bro? I'm smoking mad weed. It's Pandora, <laughs> they get, you gotta set it up. Man, get the phone out of my face. What the hell is Pandora? They keep giving me the phone. Talk to these people. I get the phone, I'm yeah, 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 all right, man. I listen to UGK. This is what I jam, blah, blah, blah. All right, bye, bro. I gave the phone <laughs> back. Shit, I looked at it now. I'm like, my stupid ass should have been on the phone trying to say, yo, let me get a percentage in this. Put all my music up for free. Let me get a percentage. That's what the me, the me now say. And now I've been waiting to talk to you about this. How do you feel about the current rap era right now? Um, I like it. I like a lot of the stuff that's out. They, they jam. You can't really say that. You can't. You can't really hate on what's going on right now. You got Detroit popping. You got Atlanta popping. New York. Everybody got some hot heat right now. I ain't gonna lie. 
and the women are going. The women are going stupid. Crazy. The women are going retarded. They finna take over rap. They are. Yeah, the women are going stupid. At first, I was like, yeah, because it was different from Carter and Nicki Minaj. But then I, it hit me. I was like, they on that ratchet. <laughs> yeah. As I know that you actually used to ghostwrite for some females as well back in the day. Yeah, I don't want to tell nobody business though. Uh, you can't give us the tea. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> I don't think these people let it be known. I don't think these people let it be known that they don't write their own stuff. So. Okay, since you can't give us the tea, it's some pretty big ones. Oh yeah, hell yeah, hell yeah. Now I know that um, this current era of rap beef is a lot more public, and it's a lot of it. So, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think peace is the answer. I don't think when it's when it's beef involved, it ain't fun. When it's when everybody cool and and focus on doing a good job at what they do. And we we, we 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 in a better position, you know. I ain't really I don't wanna be nowhere around to wanna be tough dudes or nothing nothing like that. I wanna be with a martini in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something like that. I'm on some laid back, cool, chilling, you know. Uh, and I was watching one of your interviews and uh they had asked you if you were like beefing with Kodak Black. Nah, I be jamming this music every day almost. <laughs> like, some people get tired of me jamming it. I got, he need to drop some more music. That song Peaches, or Peachy, whatever it is, I be going crazy jamming it. It's something I wake up to in the morning. So why would they think that you was like... Nah, we was jamming? playing on the internet a long oh, time okay. ago. We was just talking shit on... Me, him, and Wayne was... It was just like... We was just joking back and forth on the internet in the gym. I'm doing push-ups and shit, just joking on them. And, having fun on the internet, that's it. And so I want to talk about your new ventures too because you're also inve invested into the cannabis industry. Yeah. You got to talk to us about that. Um, yeah, I, I opened, I got involved because I feel like you got a lot of people who actually went to jail for weed possessions of small amounts of marijuana and selling it as well. It's crazy how now you could go get a license to do that. So um, a lot of the people who who been in that situation, I think they need to take advantage of it because now you could legally do it and you ain't gotta be worried about breaking the law. It's a beautiful thing. Um, I don't see nothing wrong with it. If you handle your business how it's supposed to be handled. So. I'm, I'm with anything that's, that's legit and that I could sleep good, you know. And it, it could be a lot of money involved, but if I don't get good sleep with it, I don't want to do it. Something I could sleep good knowing I'm, I'm proud of what I'm doing, you know. I'm with that. Is it a little harder for, like, black men to actually get into the cannabis industry? Nah, it's not. You know, you got Arkansas. They legal, um, Oklahoma legal. They don't care if you black or white. You just fill out the application. They don't care. They don't, they don't care. And it's getting back into your music. I know you just dropped a visual. You gotta tell us about that. I just dropped a couple visuals and I'm finna drop another visual. I'm actually shooting a video right now. I just stopped shooting a video to come here. I'm finna go back and finish shooting it when I leave here. Um, I dropped a song called Dope. It's just telling my story of what's been going on with me for the last past year. Um, anything you might want to know. Might not have everything, but it'll catch you up to speed as to what's been going on. Um, I dropped another one called Back to Back, produced by my, my boy Doug Magic. He went stupid, I went stupid. Um, they running up views right now on YouTube. So right now I'm just about to really get behind everything and give it, give it the push that it deserves because it's doing numbers on its own. How does it feel to be back pursuing your artistry? Feel good, feel good, feel good. Um, I feel like this is what I was born to do. 
I just needed to be able to do it as my own boss. It don't mean I don't want to do business with nobody, but I want to be treated like a boss. I'm going to treat you like one and you treat me like one, you know. And that's, that's what it's all about, respect. I'm big on that. If that's in the play, then I'm in the way. <laughs> do you think you'll eventually start your own label? Yeah, I got a label right now. It's called 5150 Empire. The, the infrastructure being laid. Um, I got some hella five people working with me. Um, J and Two. Doug Magic doing some hella five production. Um, Fool with the camera shooting some dope videos. So right now, I kind of got like a, a little cool squad. And we ain't going to try to move too fast, we're gonna make sure we make the right moves, you dig? We ain't trying to crash and burn, we're trying to last. Last and learn, not crash and burn. <laughs> and what would you say is something differently that you're doing with your label that wasn't done to you as an artist? Um, I'm actually telling the people around me how important money is and what they should do with it when they get it. That's good. Um, and I'm trying to show them as well, show them a couple business moves that I make or may have made that worked up. Try to pick their brain to see if I could connect any dots that ain't connected. You know, if I can, you know, give them a light bulb to go off. That's what's big, is making sure everybody's straight mentally outside of getting the money and outside of <sighs> going to the club. That's such a good point because I feel like yeah. right now, and you know how we're heavily on social media, the younger ones, they looking up to all of the new up and coming rappers. And I feel like mental health, when it comes to the industry, it really gets swept under the rug. Yeah, yeah. A lot of these labels should probably get therapists for these artists. You got a 17 year old who just got millions and millions of dollars and a bunch of friends asking them this and pe these people persuading them to do this. He might need to talk to somebody to know which direction he's supposed to be going at this time. Cause he being pulled a million ways and his brain ain't even wired up to understand everything yet. He's 16. I definitely agree. And what else do we have next coming up for you? Music, I'm gonna keep dropping. Just keep checking me out. YouTube, Spotify, all the platforms that you listen to your music on just just keep going there every week and i'm gonna keep dropping that's what it is right now you got any shows we could be on the lookout for yeah i'm finna go to la when i leave here on the 22nd i'll be in la i forgot what venue but i'll be in los angeles on the 22nd yes we love to see it yeah that's my <laughs> next stop and before we wrap up do you have any last words or shout outs man thank god you did that's all I got to say is thank the man up above. And don't be no screw. Get you some money, man. Get you some money. If you ain't getting no money, then we ain't got nothing to talk about. Get you some money, Jack. And that's that. <laughs> Them back to back losses ahead, you was lost that you shouldn't have been sending that shit in the mail. I told a plug he need a better method until he get that don't send another bill. They never beef over money, 